Well, what a wonderful morning it is just to uh, hear Randy announcing those names and praying for these precious uh, new souls who have been added to uh, the Lord's number is just uh, encouraging. It's worth the worth the price of admission just to uh, think about that, to be able to be together with these young people and all, all of us who have uh, been blessed to participate in the salvation that Jesus has come to, to make available to us. And we want to uh, continue to remember these young people as they begin their journey with the Lord and encourage them in every way that we can. There's going to be, I would say to all of us and to, to these young people in particular, along the way there will be a lot of adversity. There's going to be a lot of opposition to you uh, as you walk with the Lord, but you'll never walk alone. You'll always have him at your side, his spirit within you and uh, brothers and sisters that you can lean upon in the journey. So uh, just wonderful, wonderful morning. And along those lines, we want to remind everyone that the youth in college weekend is coming up pretty quickly. It's going to be July 26th through 28th. And we're going to have Uh, Brothers Keith Stonehart and Bill Sanchez, uh, both who have been here before for the Youth Weekend back, and uh, they're going to be speaking to the young people about uh, being set apart, being set apart wholly in terms of our purpose, our character, and our relationships. So we want to encourage uh, everyone uh, to support that in prayer. Also to uh, the parents and the young people, if you've not registered for that and you plan to come, please do so. The sooner you register, the easier it is on those coordinating it to make proper preparations. And um, if you also would like to make a donation to help uh, offset the cost of of that event, please see Dave Coffey as he will be taking those up from individuals who want to contribute. Well, this morning, I'm again excited for so many reasons, so many good things happening, but one of them is that as announced a few weeks ago, and something that Jarrett and I have been thinking about, praying about, planning for quite some time is a new series a major series, and I called them major, kind of like the major and minor prophets. They're, they're, they're not necessarily one better than the other, but some are just longer. And this is going to be a major series. We're going to spend several weeks working our way uh, through uh, the book of James, the New Testament book of James, and we're calling it Walking in Wisdom. You could, you could title this series any number of things, thought about using Faith Works, Uh, because of James chapter 2, where James does what so many of us want to separate. James brings together and tells us that a faith that is real is a faith that works. And not only that, faith actually works. Uh, There's a lot of things in this world that are hawked, a lot of things that are sold, but a steadfast commitment to and trust in the power of God and His goodness unleashed in our lives is something that actually works, and it works when you need it the very most. But we've decided to go with the the idea of walking in wisdom because wisdom is a key part of the theme through the book of James. He echoes not only a lot of the Sermon on the Mount, but also the Old Testament book of Proverbs and gives us practical wisdom for daily living. James gets uh, right down where the uh, rubber meets the road, as they say, very practical and uh, very aggressive. He doesn't cut us any slack. He tells us how it is and gives us the wisdom that we need to live our lives in this world. And he contrasts in the book, as we'll see at sort of the high point or the climactic phrase in the book, two kinds of wisdom, an earthly and demonic wisdom. Get those terms. These are James's, an earthly and demonic wisdom, a wisdom that is according to this world that kind of seems to us like it would work, but at its root, it actually uh, is, is demonic. And it leads, he says, to disorder, to unproductive and unnecessary divisions, conflicts, and ultimately every evil thing, he says, becomes manifest when people either individually, in a family, or in a community like the church, begins to subscribe to the wisdom of this world, this earthly and demonic wisdom, every evil thing shows up, and it fractures, it divides, it destroys. But in contrast to that, James appeals to us to look to a wisdom 
from above, a wisdom that descends from above, a wisdom that's sort of alien to our natural way of thinking, but something that God can give us if we look to him and to his word. And as a result of subscribing to his wisdom, we can have a harvest of righteousness and peace, he says. A wisdom that makes us whole. As individuals, as groups, and as a church, we can become like Christ and whole by appealing to the wisdom and walking according to the wisdom from above. So that's all I'm going to say in terms of just overarching introductory material. And we're just going to dive right in this morning and look at chapter 1, verse 1 as a beginning place. This is where James introduces himself and gives his greeting. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. So the letter is from someone called James. This is actually an English version of a Greek translation of the Hebrew name Jacob. We could have called the book the book of Jacob. It's in our English speaking called the book of James. But what's really important and really interesting here is who James is. There are a few possibilities, but from ancient times down to the present, scholarly consensus is that this James is the younger half-brother of Jesus. And we say younger because Jesus was Mary's firstborn son. And we say half-brother because according to Scripture, God's, uh, Jesus' father is none other than, than God. And so we have his half-brother born to Mary by Joseph uh, as the oldest of the natural-born siblings of Jesus. Now, that could be surprising to some who may come from a church tradition that teaches that, that Mary did not have any other children. But the New Testament is very clear in multiple places that Jesus did have younger siblings. And James is the oldest, apparently, of his younger siblings. And we're told that in John chapter 7 and verse 5 that, G, that James, along with some of the other brothers, did not believe in Jesus while Jesus was doing his three years of earthly ministry. Exactly what it means that they didn't believe, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know that it means that they just rejected every claim that Jesus was making, whether they just simply doubted whether or not he was truly the Son of God or whether they, they just doubted uh, his mission and didn't believe in the way that he was doing things. For whatever reason, they lacked faith to be all in committed followers in G of Jesus during the time that Jesus was walking the earth, teaching, healing, and doing his public ministry. And then that all changed because we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 7 that one of the people that Jesus appeared to after he was raised from the dead was his brother James. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's understandable growing up, if you have siblings growing up, trying to accept the idea that your, your brother, the one that you're sharing a bathroom with, is the son of God. And it would have had to have been a, a real trial for James because you can sort of imagine Mary in the, you know, one room doing hard work, and she hears some arguing in the room next, and it, she hears James' voice and Jesus' voice. And she just, you know, instinctively says, James, you know, stop it. Go ahead and give yourself a spanking, James, because I know it's your fault. Jesus never does anything wrong. And uh, <laughs> so James is growing up uh, with all this, and, and, and it, it's, it's hard for him to come to this conclusion about his, his older brother, but, but when Jesus appears to him personally, after he had died on the cross, he's resurrected, and in resurrection power, resurrection life, he has this meeting with his brother. At that point, James is all in. James becomes a full-fledged believer, and not only that, after Peter sort of disappears from the scene in the Jerusalem church, James becomes the most prominent member of that congregation, the most prominent leader among the Christians in the city of Jerusalem. And for 20 years, he is a leader in the church at Jerusalem until in 62 AD, he is murdered by the establishment, the, the temple establishment, who become jealous of the conversions of, 
of many of the Jews to Jesus. And so they take James up to the pinnacle of the temple and they throw him down. And he is severely injured but not dead and they finish him off by stoning. Up until that time, he had a couple of nicknames. He was known as James the Just because of his impartial treatment of all people. And that becomes very evident as we read through this book. But he's also referred to as old camel knees, which is kind of weird. Like, why would you call somebody camel knees? Maybe it's just he was, if you've ever seen a camel, they're kind of awkward looking. But we're we're told the reason that he got that name is because, as you know, when camels get up and down, they get down on their knees and they develop these really thick calluses on their knees. And so he was camel knees because apparently he spent so much time in prayer that his knees actually developed calluses on them. And so James the Just, camel knees, who was a servant, he says, of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's interesting to note that he doesn't introduce himself as, hey, everybody look at me, I'm Jesus' brother. But he says, you know, I'm just, I'm just like you are. I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he writes it to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. That is the 12 tribes who were scattered, the Jewish believers who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. He's not writing it, therefore, to a particular church addressing their specific problems. But he's writing it to ultimately all believers everywhere addressing general needs that confront all of us as we strive to live a godly life in this world. And so this very practical book teaches us how to walk in wisdom. And he opens by challenging us, challenging us to adopt an unusual perspective on difficult circumstances. How do you typically greet or meet difficult circumstances? When something happens that you weren't anticipating, that you weren't planning on, but an adverse circumstance simply presents itself to you and there's, there's no way around it, you're going to have to endure or go through or confront a trial. I know what my natural instinct to, is to that. I know what my earthly wisdom tells me how to react to earthly problems. But James is calling us again to an unusual perspective. And he says in verse two, here's what I want you to do. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you fall in or when you face various trials of various kinds. Consider it pure joy, uh, unalloyed joy, pure joy, when you face these trials, when you fall into all kinds of difficulties, and he doesn't have a specific kind of trial in mind. He says various trials. So as, as broad as the difficulties, adversities, and hard circumstances of life are, whenever you fall into one of those or you're confronted with facing these, consider that an opportunity for rejoicing. Now that's unusual. That's not natural, and this is why we're saying we're going to have to learn from James how to adopt a wisdom from above. And clearly, this is a wisdom from above, the the wisdom that Jesus, who is from above, teaches us when also in the Sermon on the Mount, he gives the same advice. When he tells us that we are mistreated on account of, of doing what is right, we should rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is our reward in heaven. And so James echoes this same kind of calling to us and to the modern ear, our ears, this just sounds absurd if we're honest. You know, I've got a a bad diagnosis and I'm supposed to rejoice. I've got serious issues in my relationships and I should rejoice. I'm being mistreated for doing the right thing and I should have joy. Well, I think to modern ears and our ability to cope with difficulties, uh, experts who research this kind of thing say that modern Americans are the worst in history of anybody who who can uh, have resilience and deal well with, cope well with trying circumstances. Um, And I think that there's three reasons why we as modern people 
have such a hard time rejoicing in the face of adversity. And it's because of a belief system that we have adopted, perhaps even as Christians, we allow this belief system, this wisdom, this worldly wisdom to creep into our thinking. And it's this worldly wisdom that makes suffering unbearable, that makes trials and hardships more than we feel like we can take on. And the first of these three, and each of them I think is a little worse than the other, but notice all of them and see if any of this affects you. First, we believe, we live in a technological age. That is, we believe that we are in control. And there's really nothing that happens in this world that that we shouldn't be able to make it go away. Um... Whether it's suffering or disease or death, even death, we're told by many experts today is merely a technical problem. And at some point in the near future, we're going to figure out how to even deal with that as a, as a technical problem. And we are in control. We should be able to eliminate all of the problems that confront us in life. And I, I love, uh, I know I quote him all the time, but it just is such a remarkable Insight. C.S. Lewis says this. Notice if it's not true. He says, of, of old, in, in times past, the cardinal or chief problem of, hu- of human life was how to conform the soul, the self, to objective reality. And the solution was wisdom, discipline, and virtue. In other words, throughout the centuries, whenever you look back at, at, at traditional cultures, their, their number one problem that they wanted to address in life was how, to, how do I get myself to change to uh, um, properly adjust to objective reality. There's, there's a way that the world actually is, and I've got to, through wisdom, discipline, and virtue, and courage, figure out a way to get myself in alignment with how things actually are in this world. But, he says, for the modern mind, the cardinal problem is how to subdue reality to our wishes. And the solution is technique. The solution is technology. You see, we don't want to change ourselves in order to fit into the way the world actually is. We just want to change the way the world actually is and all the problems that we, we encounter with it. And if we can just come up with the right technique, the right technology, we can eliminate every problem that confronts mankind. And that way, I don't have to have wisdom. I don't have to have discipline. I don't have to have virtue or courage. I just need to have the skill to manipulate objective reality to make it be whatever I want it to be. But the problem with this is, is that in spite of the amazing things that we have been able to do with technology, we still cannot make all of our problems go away, and we never will. And as long as we think in life that I I don't have to change, I can make the world change around me, we're going to live with frustration every time we encounter that which is bigger and more problematic than we can handle. But secondly, we not only live in a technological age and think that we we should be in control of everything, we live in an amoral age, which means that we don't believe that there's really that right and wrong, and we don't believe that sin exists, and we don't believe that there's consequences to sin. Everything is therapeutic, everything is medicalized, everything, again, is reduced to technique, and it has nothing to do with with the moral decisions that I make and the influence and impact that they have on my life. In fact, we just reject out of hand as modern people the teaching of Genesis chapter 3. And that is that we live in a fallen world and that God has subjected this world to futility with thorns and thistles, with pain and suffering and ultimately death because of the sinfulness of mankind. And so instead of saying when we look at a broken world and our broken lives and our broken decisions that we actually deserve some measure of difficulty, adversity, and suffering in this life. We believe as moderns 
that we deserve a good life. We have the right to a, to a good life. That there's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong with humanity. In fact, I saw a survey recently that 90% of Americans believe that if everyone showed the same kind of character and love toward others that they themselves show, that all of our problems would go away. <laughs> we all think that the, we're, we're good. It's just all those other people. But the reality is that the Bible tells us that we are sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. And that one of the things God has done is built into the system frustration, difficulty, adversity. Because the worst thing that can happen to a sinner is that he just goes on, everything still works out for him, and his character just grows more and more dark. But there's something about the difficulties in life, and especially the horizon of death that is always in front of us, that at least calls us back to thinking about God and about my destiny and about my character and my morality. But in the modern world, we don't believe in any of those things. And we think that if life isn't going my way, I'm somehow being cheated and mistreated. And we shake our fists at God. And then the third reason, and perhaps most insidious of all, is that we live in a secular age. And by that it's the viewpoint that this life is all there is. There is nothing else. When you die, you're like Rover, you are dead all over. <laughs> and therefore, whatever happiness is to be found in life has got to be found now. This is it, got the one shot, and if I miss out on all the joy, all the experiences, all the happiness that I crave, and I don't get it right now, then I'll never get it. People believe this. And again, we fall as Christians very much into this trap, even if we wouldn't explicitly say it. We begin to intuitively feel it and think this way. And this is why modern Americans are absolutely devastated when our investments tank, when a relationship fails, when our health is disrupted when our retirement gets delayed, perhaps indefinitely. You see, trouble is so troubling, not just because of the events that happen in our lives that are undesirable, but because of the attitude and response that we have to it. And these modern frames are the kinds of things that make it impossible to do what James tells us to do, and that is rejoice when you are confronted with a trial in life. And James tells us to consider these trials as occasions for joy because, he says, verse 3, you know something. As a Christian, you ought to know this something at least. You can rejoice in the face of a trial because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So trials, he says, are a first, I want us to notice, a test of our faith. We're facing a trial, we should instinctively think, not, oh no, my life is over, I can never experience the happiness in this one life that I'm going to have, and I ought not to have to experience this, God owes me better than that, and if, if somebody were doing the right thing and had the right technique, all the problem would go away. Instead of all of that, we face the trial and we say, here's an opportunity for me to rejoice because this trial is number one going to test my faith, and in that testing, it's going to strengthen me and make me a more steadfast persevering person of deeper character than I was before I faced this adversity. As Brandon read for us uh, so well a moment ago, Peter addresses a similar thought when he says, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come that, you, that the proven genuineness of your faith, a faith that's more precious than gold, even if it's refined by fire, it's still going to perish. But your faith that comes through the test of fire results, he says, in praise, glory, and honor. Now, if I understand that right, he's telling us that when the Lord Jesus comes, Jesus is going to have praise 
and give glory and honor to us as we have persevered through the trials and shown the genuineness of our faith. What an amazing thing. And if we're Christians, we should know that this test, this fiery trial that I'm facing is an occasion to bring me closer to that reality. We live in an age that we say is an age of authenticity, but I'm just not sure that that's correct because as I've said before, it seems to me to be the fakest age in the history of, of, of mankind. And maybe we want to be authentic. Maybe we want to be real. Maybe we want to know, is my faith real? Am I here for the right reasons? Am I doing things for the right, uh, on the right basis? Or am I just a cultural Christian, a fair weather Christian? I just kind of like to hang around with nice people and it's good for business anyway. And so I'll just be a part of this Christian, Christianity thing. But when the circumstances of our life begin to deteriorate and we're faced with trials, do you know what goes away with good circumstances? Artificial, counterfeit, what's in it for me, religion. That also goes away. And what's left is a purified faith that I'm able to look at in the, in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm still standing, I'm still believing, I'm still praising God because of who he is and of what he rightly deserves, not because merely of what's in it for me in the here and now. And so we can say, the trials bring joy when they prove the authenticity of our confidence in God. It's a moment of joyful discovery when you get hit hard, but your faith remains intact. And you're able then to say in the midst of a world that's falling to pieces around you, you're able to say with the psalmist, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And so as you persevere in faith through trial, we have the purification of our faith, but we also have more. That's, that's not all, as the commercial says. James 1 verse 4, let perseverance finish its work. You're developing this strength as you endure the trial and let, stay with it, is his point. Let it finish its job. Don't, don't run away from the trial. Don't just run away from the relationship that's no longer fulfilling, fulfilling and I'm just gonna abandon it therefore. Um, but rather, he says, persevere in the trial. Let it have its full effect on your life so that you may be, he says, notice the words, complete, mature, and not lacking in anything, made whole. The trials actually have the galvanizing effect of transforming our character into something real and something solid when we don't run away, when we patiently endure and we don't quit. I look up from here at any number of people gathered this morning who have been through fiery trials, grave disappointments, some of which have gone on for decades, and you're still standing. You're still here. You still have joy. You still have faith. You still have hope. You're still raising up your hallelujah in the midst of your difficulty. Your faith is real. It's genuine. It's been tested in the fire and it has been proven to be more genuine and more precious than gold itself. And there's joy that comes in the realization of all of that. And we gain character along the way. You know, in trials, we tend to only look at what we're losing. That's my problem. I hate losing ground. And in the trial, I, I get focused on what I'm losing but James says, look deeper and see what you're gaining. See what you're gaining. That's how you can look at it with joy. And so we could say that those who faithfully endure gain more than they lose. Those who faithfully endure gain more than they lose. 
you become perfect, complete, and whole. You know, we admire the faith of Abraham, and we admire the character of Joseph, and we marvel at the patience of Job. Faith, character, and patience. We say, man, those, those are great. And these are three characters that had it in, in, in a, an amazing and abundant degree. But how did they, how did they get there? You, you can't get to where your heroes got without walking the path that they walked. And they got great faith by having their faith tested, forged their characters in the fiery trials of life, and became patient to endure even the horrific things that Job did by remaining faithful in the trial. And so we should look at these people, see how they got there, and when we are confronted with a similar trial, say, this is my opportunity to be purified and to develop a character like those of my heroes of faith. And so if any of you, he says in verse 5, lacks wisdom... Let him ask of God who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given him. Now, it sounds like James is sort of changing the subject, but he's not. The wisdom that he's talking about here is specific wisdom, the wisdom to know how to handle a trial properly, to receive it and meet it and greet it with joy, And let it have its perfect work of refining us and developing our character so that we're whole. And when we face, when you face and I face our particular trials, we often do not see how this trial could produce a good result. And so we lack wisdom. And what we are called to do in those moments is ask God to give it. And God is a generous giver. He loves to give good gifts to his children, and he specifically says if we need the insight to to know how to handle a trial well, if we ask it, he will give it. But it requires, again, this wisdom from above. Not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom from above. Worldly wisdom says, I know how things should go. This trial is not a part of the plan. This trial is ruining my life. That's the wisdom of the world in the phrase face of trials. But the wisdom from above says, Lord, things are not going according to my plan or the way that I thought they should. And then clearly that means that my theory of how things should go is inadequate. Lord, Show me your way. Do you see the difference between the two? What is the key difference? The key difference is the difference between pride, human pride. I know how things ought to go. Things aren't going the way they should go. And it's ruining my life. And I'm angry and upset. And I'm not changing. Humility is the wisdom of humility says. The wisdom that comes from above. Things aren't going my way. Clearly the way that I think things should go is inadequate. Lord, show me your way. And so when we do that and we pray for that, James says, not only will we receive what we ask, but we need to approach it with this right attitude. He says, let him, let him ask in faith. Ask for this wisdom in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven by, uh, the, by the winds and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Now, Very quickly, the the doubt here is the doubt of thinking that nothing good can come from this. Nothing good can come from the pain that I'm experiencing. It's arbitrary, it's needless, it's pointless. It's happening to me because God is uh, unaware or God is indifferent or God is just altogether absent anyway. And that's, that's why this said, that's the doubts that can fill our minds when we're going through the trial. And, and that doubt will not get you anywhere. That doubt will not grow you through the trial into a deeper, more refined person of character. In fact, I've found in my experience that when things are going rough and things have turned upside down, that trials and confusion 
come my way that, that doubt is the thing that helps the least. What does help is stability of mind, a fixed determination that I'm going to hold fast to the belief that God is and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so I'm going to say, all my life you have been faithful. And I'm going to continue to serve you and trust you all the way through this and see it to the end. And here's why we can do that. Verse 12. Blessed or happy is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. God's goals for you are not a trouble-free life of self-maximizing. It's not a wrinkle-free set of relationships that you can just check out of any time the going gets rough. And it's not early retirement on the beach at Palm Springs. He has so much more that God wants to do in our lives. He wants to make you a man or a woman or a young person of strength, of character, of patience, of hope, and above all else, a person of love. And trials, it seems to be, are a necessary ingredient to bringing these kinds of things around. And ultimately, God wants to make you and me as much like Jesus as he possibly can during our sojourn in this world. And if Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, why should we expect or even at the deepest level, want anything else. If he brings a trial into our life, it's because God is good. He knows how things should be. And this, if I meet it and greet it in the right way, is going to work out for my ultimate, eternal, and everlasting happiness. So I'll rejoice even in the tears. And you can weep and you can rejoice at the same time. And so James, in his wisdom from above, invites us to embrace the trials of life, to let them have their perfect work that the God of heaven intends for them to accomplish in our lives and see the benefit and reward that he brings. If you're not a Christian this morning, we want to end this first lesson in our series by inviting you to come and bow the knee to James' older brother, If his little brother could bow the knee and acknowledge Jesus as Lord and say, I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can too. And if you're willing and ready this morning to put him on in baptism, confessing his name, then we'd be honored to help you, however we can do so, while we stand and while we sing for your encouragement.